Welcome to the Evolving Past Alzheimer's podcast, where we are focused on bringing you information to help prevent from developing and improve from suffering with brain diseases like Alzheimer's and other dementias. I'm Dr. Nate Bergman, a physician and chief scientific wellness officer at Kemper Cognitive Wellness, and I'll be your guide on these sound waves. So whether you're a baby boomer who's worried that your brain wiring just isn't working like it once was, or you have a loved one with the disease, or you yourself have already been diagnosed and are wondering, what do I do now? You'll want to listen to this podcast. Each episode, we introduce you to the top doers and thinkers that are revisioning Alzheimer's, dementia, and just generally things in life's second half. If you have questions or comments, check us out on social media. To support us, go to patreon.com forward slash evolving past and consider hitting the button and becoming a patron of this show if you find these episodes valuable. That's Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, patreon.com forward slash evolving past. So here we go. Let's get better. Welcome back to the show. I have a really cool guest uh, this show. Dr. Joe Diduro. He is president of Neuropathy Treatment Centers of America and president of ProLight uh, Medical Technologies Company. Very, very interesting uh, paper he presented we're going to discuss today. It was actually a poster that he presented at a, a conference. Uh, welcome to the show, Joe. Hey, Nate. Great to be here. So Joe, you are a doctor of chiropractic medicine and a chiropractic neurologist, which is the term that's, I think, new to a lot of people, can you just kind of give a rundown at what a chiropractic neurologist is and how maybe that is different than a standard chiropractor that maybe most people are familiar with? Well, my company, I think, uh, my company is ProNeuroLight, and I'm a doctor of chiropractic. It's not really doctor of chiropractic medicine. Okay. And uh, a chiropractic neurologist has had more advanced training in the examination and uh, application of different therapies to rehabilitate the nervous system. So I uh, passed my diplomat exam, I think in 2000, if I recall. So that's kind of like a specialized training. You know, back when I did it, we used the uh, infrared video nystagraphy to check out how you know, your balance and stuff is working. And they're doing a lot, a lot of advances in that field in the neurophysiology. I presented the, this poster at the International Conference of Neuroscientists down in Orlando for the chiropractic neurologist group. Yeah. Podium presentation at the North American Association of Laser Therapists this summer. So this is interesting. I, I was, um, when you sent me the poster, Something about it rung a bell, and I, I was recently at a really an amazing gathering in Palo Alto um, called Transformative Technologies, sort of a cross-section of technologists and healthcare practitioners and software engineers, data scientists, and neuroscientists, and um, really kind of helped me rediscover some of the potentials of light and laser therapy, which is, you know, I think where most of our conversation will go uh, this evening. It's really easy for me with, you know, pretty serious background in some of these things to get lost in terminology. And I would say that's all the more so for our listeners who may have less uh, background, although everybody's smart, that seems to listen to the show, but may have less, you know, just need sort of a primer. And maybe we can pre-digest some of the terminology uh, before we get deep into the poster that you presented on transcranial and intranasal uh, photobiomodulation. But just starting off, like when people say photobiomodulation, and we did have Dr. Marvin Berman as a guest uh, before, uh, and so some of our listeners may be familiar with photobiomodulation, also known as PBM, I think. Mm -hmm. Can you just give us a, a brief introduction to PBM and what that means? So I think that uh, this is the easy part, and it gets more technical from here, but the photo biomodulation. I tend to think of it as photo, that's energy or light. Bio is cell or tissue and modulation is change or transform. So as some of the other research have demonstrated, it's light brings energy into the body. Is that pretty simple? 
Yeah. And so then people talk about, you know, app, like, you know, practical applications for things like electroceuticals, neuroceuticals, lights and lasers and LEDs. Like what is sort of the, um, the application, practical application of PBM? Is it lights? Is it lasers? Is it both? Well, I mean, that to, you know, my co-author, uh, Prashad Salafor from Iran is a medical physicist. And so I tend to dodge all those questions and throw them up you know, for him to, to hit. But I think basically what you're, what you're looking at is energy being used by the body. And humans are natural and they always had light. And now we don't have as much light on us and it affects us in many ways. So the application of light is such, we kind of think of it as a, as a vitamin. You know, you can think of it that way as a booster that way. But if you look at it from laser light and LED light and natural light, and multicolored light, you know, it's just energy that comes into the body. And so, you know, the darkness of the part that we don't really understand about this as we're shining light on it is what is the best dose? How, what's the best way to use this tool and the other tool? And I have to say, I'm very active in the research on this i've been collaborating with people you know across the country but laser application does something led application does something how do we measure it i've been speaking with investigators from the university of texas arlington who are very much world renowned in their ability to measure cerebral vascular increases with a high powered laser and when we went in there, we didn't really see the changes that were happening with more of an LED, which is like a slow burn. So some of the power, like a light bulb has 100 watts of power and the LEDs may have 12 milliwatts and a high powered laser will have 200 milliwatts. And then when you start to look at it, what tissue are you interacting with and then how is it scattered by the tissue and penetration? It, it, it's like playing chess on five levels. So you've been working with these these lights and lasers for a while, right? I mean, you've yeah. you've background is in the president of the Neuropathy Treatment Centers of America. How did you kind of get into this working with lights and lasers, and and what were your initial applications like clinic? You know, what we what were we using them for initially? Well, you know, it kind of circles back the same way. Uh, I was practicing in Italy, and my Mother flew back from a conference with, that my brother went to in San Francisco. When she landed, she couldn't get out of the the uh, airplane, mm. and they had to bring her in a wheelchair. And she was, you know, very embarrassed that she couldn't walk. So she did all the tests and all the MRIs and all the EMGs. And they said, "Well, Mickey, you know, you're you're not sick enough, but you should be able to walk." And I'm over there in Italy, not being able to do anything. And I said, "Ma, I think you got this, you know, neuropathy," and. Uh, you know, my brother, that we started to put a little bit of, uh, you know, laser light therapy on her that we had. And she recovered quite nicely. And I was researching it. So, you know, I said, well, let's get some different lights and some different LEDs and see what we can do. And, and that started a, a decade of teaching other doctors how to address, diagnose and treat to peripheral neuropathy. We forgot to say that I'm a, I have a master's degree in clinical research. Oh, thank you. It kind of makes me an outlier on another level because, you know, I was always taking data, but now I figured out what to do with it, sort of. <laughs> so we did a lot of studies on neuroregeneration with uh, people who had uh, neuropathic pain. So we would see sensation come back and pain go down and balance improve. And nobody could really figure out, well, why do you think this is happening? And I said, well, I think the nerves are probably growing back. And we actually had a case report using intraepidermal nerve fiber densities that we actually showed the nerves did regrow. And the funny thing was that it was the first time in the literature that has actually shown at like a therapeutic agent, there was only four cases in the literature. And most of them were taking people off some kind of bad drug or treating their thyroid condition. And we had a super regrowth of these nerves. And so we, we kept investigating on how the heck does this happen? And I was speaking today with Dr. Thomas Burke, who's one of the founding fathers of low-level laser therapy research with photobiomodulation, kind of going over this stuff in the car ride. And he's a co-author, and he's done a lot of work for the old Anodyne company and, and things like that. So, yeah, we have been doing it for a long time. And 
we did the neurodegeneration, or excuse me, neuroregeneration of the feet. And, you know, we said, well, it's all one nervous system. I just would like to have a little bit more evidence before I tell people, you know, put the light pads on your head and then everybody gets in trouble. All right. And in 2017, they came out with the, uh, the paper, uh, for the Salt March paper that showed, hey, I was at the conference and I was very excited by the things that they were saying. So I said, well, if these guys can fix it, the nerves by putting the lights on the head. So can I, you know, I have a light company. I make, make LEDs. So away we went. So one of the things was we found that mitochondria are a big part of peripheral neuropathy. So they showed that in, you know, HIV related neuropathy that the mitochondria don't move up and down the nerves through their microtubules. And they also found that uh, in like a, a chemo induced neuropathy that only the sensory nerves were affected. And so mm-hmm. researchers at McGill, I think his name is Bennett, he kept looking at the rat model of this paclitaxel induced which is a chemo-induced uh, neuropathy. And they kept looking and looking and they said, well, the rats have neuropathy, but we can't really find anything wrong with their nerves. And they kept looking and they kept looking until they looked at the mitochondria and they found that in the rats that had a chemo-induced neuropathy, that the mitochondria were swollen. That would give them difficulty in movement and energy production and everything like that. So I was like, hey, I've and I bet you this is a big mitochondrial thing as far as the neuropathy goes. And sort of circle back to say, well, you know, we know that the photobiomodulation has a direct effect on neurogenesis and angiogenesis. And, you know, there's a whole lot to study about the mitochondrial level and, and what they say the activity is of that. So you have found that primarily what's known about photobiomodulation, lasers and lights, is that... It's primary, to, depending on what type of light I think it is, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, depending on sort of what the light source, red light or near-infrared light or whatnot, that it has effect at the mitochondrial level. Is that correct? So here's how it works. So the light has to get to the tissue, to the cell, and then it has to activate that cell somehow. And so, you know, we're looking at different tissues that that light's going to pass through. So it can affect skin and melatonin and collagen and everything that's going through is having the the light is affecting the tissue and the tissue is affecting the light. See how that goes? Yeah. And so even if one photon gets down there, that's kind of small, one photon gets down there and hits a tissue, it still has to have something to affect. So let me explain to you this way. They used to say that uh, my professor, Professor Carrick at the when we did the diplomat courses, he said, ice cream is good, but if you stick it on your forehead, it has an effect. But if you stick it in your mouth, it has a much better effect. And that sort of relates to the color of the light and the wavelength of the light is going to have an effect on the tissue that it touches. So that's sort of how some people are using blue lights and red lights and infrared lights and far infrared and near infrared. So everything is finding that every different wavelength is going to affect a different tissue underneath it. So think about that. I mean, that's a lot of different calculations when you just turn a red light on somebody or put infrared on them. Absolutely. So you designed this um, light helmet, correct? Well, I mean, we designed a, a bunch of different products, but just to circle back, one thing is that it happens that the receptors that we know a lot about for this light energy or the photon energy that comes in has got to affect a chromophore, something that will accept that light. So it's the ice cream going in the mouth versus, you know, just bouncing off the head. So it's going to have a very good reaction. You could say, oh, this is vanilla versus if you put it on your head, you wouldn't really tell what flavor it was. So mm-hmm. in the side, the, that what they're looking at is inside the mitochondria in the, uh, you know, the little Krebs cycle, the, the tr- electron transport change, each one of those little cycles is affected by different colors. And so the main thing that they're looking at is the uh, cytochrome C oxidase in the fourth, uh, I think it's the fourth section of that uh, electron transport chain. So it is having an effect. The bottom line is it 
the light that does hit the mitochondrial tissue or any kind of tissue that has the mitochondria in it will create this increase in energy production or ATP, which is a very, very good thing for our cells, especially brain cells. Yeah, absolutely. And there's, there's a whole theory on um, you know mitochondria being kind of a, a primary and early dysfunction in Alzheimer's and cognitive impairment, as you know. But I'm, I'm curious, so you, so you designed this light helmet, correct? So again, we kind of circle back and, you know, my mom has been back. She had a, a fall and she suffered a, a subdural hematoma. Oh, that's a brain bleed, right? That's a brain bleed? Right. Subdural hematoma? Right. And then she had a second one and then they did the drainage and it didn't go so good. So my mom had a brain injury, a traumatic brain injury that resulted in her having Alzheimer's. So I actually built the helmet to help my mom. <laughs> and the more I understood the, the process, you know, I'm like, uh-oh, well, we know the genetic risks for me. And the, the more I studied it, I realized, oh, well, look at all those concussions that I had. And remember the time I got knocked out over here and the time I got knocked out over there and the time I played football over here. And I was like, uh-oh, guess what, Joe? You have traumatic brain injury. Yeah. And that didn't help either. So you, didn't, you just did the statistics. And there's, you know, I think I did the statistics the other day, about 30%, it could be like 30% of America could be suffering from cognitive decline. And that's a lot. Yeah. And that's not even counting yeah. you know, the TBI people. So the way I look at it is that if you, uh, you look to your right, you look to your left, one of you is going to have you know, dementia or cognitive decline. Other one's going to be a caregiver. And the one in the middle is going to pay for it. Right. So I'm curious, though, on the design of this helmet. We use the same wavelengths that have been shown to be the most effective for nerves, which is 810 and 635. So we use the same uh, wavelengths and, and power that we used for the peripheral neuropathy and put it on the head. And what we found is that to, when we were doing the, the actual case study, we were a little nervous because this was a clinical technique and that was a lot of juice, what we were thinking. That's a lot of diodes. We have over 200 diodes, 150. What's a diode? A diode is the light emitting diode in it. We call it LED, so we used to say the diode. So those are the ones that the colors come out of. Mm -hmm. like that's what gives the power. So we use the same wavelengths that we use for in the peripheral neuropathy and that they're the, you know, the ones that are very well studied for uh, nerve. And they actually tend to you know, work pretty good. The, the infrared tends to work very well on the mitochondria. So it was a good, it was a good fit. But our clinical thing was... In the paper, in the patient that we, we wrote about, we started with a trans, the transcranial, but it's not, it's actually pancranial because we're going all the, the whole head. Not too many devices go over the whole head. And then we used a body pad also uh, because the thing about, you know, laser, quote unquote, or, or light therapy, even or photobiomodulation is that it has effects what they say off-target or abscopal effects, which means, let's say they've shown that if you put LEDs on the lower back for low back pain, depression gets better. If you put it on the tibia, aphasia will get better. So these are trying, everybody's trying to figure out uh, how is this all working? And, and uh, there's a lot of people thinking about it, but you know, we implemented a body pad to increase circulation and reduce pain for the uh, patient. And then a transcranial, and an intranasal. So we used a multimodal or three types of therapies simultaneously. Yeah, since you're into it, the one, you just go into the, um, this very interesting poster that you guys presented at the conference. Can you just kind of cover the actual case, like what, what you presented and what you found? Yeah, so the lady is a 64-year-old married Caucasian female with a history, family history of, she had Alzheimer's, diagnosed in 2011. And it was confirmed by neuropsychological testing in 2013. So she had suffered for four years. Uh, she was taking the standard uh, medications for uh, dementia, and she was taking various supplements. She stopped by the, our uh, facility in January with worsening cognitive decline. She had a her uh, sister was diagnosed with dementia at uh, 55, and she had a maternal aunt with dementia. 
He stated that her main concern was stopping her memory loss and improving its function. She stated her brain wasn't functioning very well, and the diagnosis of dementia and the loss of memory scared her. She felt that her diagnosis was a death sentence. Right. And uh, the thing is that uh, what made this sort of unique, and I'm just going to spin it a little way, is that we reported uh, after like one week of doing the, the therapy, which was just the, like the helmet and the body pad, she's like, she had done the therapy like 13 times because we did it twice a day application, which kind of nobody had done that much. But that's what we did with the nerve pain people. And so we said, well, let's just do that. And uh, within the first week of just doing the light therapy with the helmet and the body patch, she's like, hey, I'm, I'm brighter. I'm, I have a better outlook and things are coming around. I'm coming out of the fog. And I was like, that was like a week. And then after a, a month, we redid the, all the tests. So we had done, uh, we did a bunch of testing to find that it changed. And it was a very, very quick change. I'll go over the neurophysiologic test, but we also did a smell test on our clients when they started. And we found out, you know, studies confirmed that the sniff test may be useful in diagnosing early Alzheimer's and that it goes right to the hippocampus. So what you're saying is that sometimes, and it's been a fairly consistent, but not, you know, it's not always true, people lose the sense of smell and that can be an early sign of Alzheimer's, and the idea is that because where Alzheimer's primarily attacks in the brain, in the area right above where the nose is, like the nose and the bone, it's called the hippocampus, and that's an area that's a, like a primary area target for for Alzheimer's. So you noticed that she had also lost her sense of smell, and then that was improving. Right. So I kind of jumped ahead there, but she had the cognitive change, and then after a month, we redid the our screening test, but you know I'm saying the two things that were really not that it was a it was a rapid reversal of this uh, rapid changes, but some of the things that also changed were that she had a, a nausea and she couldn't smell, and then after one month, she returned her smelling returned to a baseline normal for like a dementia person, which I hadn't seen that in any of the literature that yeah, I heard of that either huh. wow. So we knew that the smell was important and we wanted to, didn't want to do a $200 test. So we used a test that was uh, developed in uh, Alberta smell test by Professor Green. And they used this Mr. Sketch smelly markers that, are, that they use. Yeah. And they have them test 20 different smells, both, you know, 10 each nostril. And then they have it uh, all the normals against like um, traumatic brain injury people and things like that. And a normal person will probably be able to smell 12 of those uh, tests and uh, you couldn't smell anything. And we, we also checked out the peanut butter test, which is a famous smell. Yeah. And she couldn't smell the peanut butter right up to her nose. And then afterwards, to our surprise, I, I personally said, I didn't think it was going to get better, but some of the people said, I don't think it's going to get better. She, she returned to, uh, she did actually smell something. And that was pretty amazing. What actually happened with her memory and cognition? Well, we tested um, a working memory questionnaire, and that, that was a that looks at how much of a frustration do you have daily with your memory. So, a non, like a, this is a zero to one hundred and twenty scale. One hundred and twenty is really really bad. If you had a normal, your score would be around eighteen. Uh, a TBI person would have a score of about 35. So that's how much like bother it gives them. So our patient had a score of 53, okay. which is a 41% okay. impairment. And after one month, it went down to 10. It was an 8% impairment, which is about a 33% improvement. That's better than normal. But better than the controls. And again, this is a subjective test, but the reality of it is that on one sense, it's you the patient or the client that that complains if you feel proud of yourself when you finish the that you didn't weren't frustrated when you did the crossword puzzle or when you checked off the grocery list that's a win for you you know oh yeah so she had a huge change in her uh, storage domain her attention domain and her executive domain on all those levels hmm. that was from doing the, the whole sort of device twice a day for 25 minutes for four weeks 
Right. Okay. 25 minutes each application. And the, also we did the MOCA test, uh, which is the Montreal Cognitive Assessment Test. It became famous when the, President Trump took the test. Yeah, it was famous in my world before then. But yeah, he got a 30 out of 30. Hopefully he didn't cheat. You know? No, no, no. Actually, Trump received a perfect score on the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. And the reality of it is, you don't get a perfect score, you get a score. So we don't know what his score was. Let's just put it that way. It's not classified that way. It's give, you, get, you get a number. It's called a score. So we don't know what his number was because they would tell you what the number was. They didn't say his number was 30. Oh, okay. So the point is that our patient had a, an initial score of 18. Uh, when she did her MMSE, I think at the, at the neuropsych people, it was about a 16. So she was classified as dementia. When she came into us, it was 18. So just to review, so you talked about two different tests. So an MMSE is a mini mental status exam, also a score out of 30. A score that's, you know, anything really less than 20 is really pretty severely impaired. The MOCA, which is a, is a little bit more sensitive for subtle changes. So her score was 18 on that, which is also quite impaired. They, typically anything less than 19 or 20 is pretty impaired, you know, sort of borderline on the dementia range. But of course, we don't use that just by itself to diagnose dementia or Alzheimer's, but it is pretty suggestive of significant, significant cognitive impairment. So her scores were low. That's all before she wore the device, the light helmet. Right. When, and then when we uh, retested her 28 days later, her score was 24. On the MOCA? On the MOCA. Wow. In four weeks, that was a six-point change. I hadn't seen that in the literature, but that rapid of change to that amount. And uh, that's why we kind of said that was pretty, I mean, everything was pretty amazing about this person. And I think when you're looking at a case report and, you know, we did a lot of different things and we presented a lot of different aspects, but it just gives you an example of what is possible. You know, like not everybody that comes in with a 17 or 18 may have these types of changes, but it shows you that, you know, this is a, a person had genetic risk and had all these things and bang, light energy coming into the body start to turn things on. We think of it as a broad, you know, Yes, we can stack this on top of all the hormones and get all your teeth out, get the mold out. But if you put the light on their head and they become more compliant and they understand more, it sort of makes the whole protocols that you're going to put people through. And we do have a whole functional you know, medicine approach that we apply to these people. But with this one, we just said, what's going to happen when we just put the light on? Yeah. And now, can I point out something else that was pretty interesting is... Just to circle back to my mom, if I could, we finished this test in February and I was writing it up and writing it up. And my mom's primary caregiver of the last 20 years, her boyfriend, fell down the stairs and suffered an, an unsurvivable injury and died. And I became the primary caregiver for my mom about five months ago. And let me tell you, caregiver stress is real and it is real real deal. And it's a crushing, you know, some of the statistics is like, you know, it's unpaid and the stress and the, the result of cognitive decline from the stress and the depression and all that stuff. So the thing that we always said was this program was really set up to be in the, in the family. So if you have a mild cognitive impairment and you can understand the instructions and follow through with the protocols, you're sort of doing your care yourself. But once you start to slip you need a caregiver. And the point is, we said, you know what? The caregiver is going to do the care too. The caregiver is going to put the light on his back or her back and put the light on his head to relax and helps with depression and helps with the sleep. And, you know, these are, this is the, the bonuses of transcranial photobiomodulation that's been researched. So everybody gets better. It's an at home therapy that helps the family unit you know, the part that has a disease, disease, get better. You know, caregiver is a diagnosis that there's, there's no really, nobody gives them any therapy for it. Yeah, no, caregiver stress is a diagnosis, an ICD-10, you know, codable diagnosis. That was a while ago. Have you had any follow-up with this lady? Like, how is she doing now? 
don't don't bother her too much. We haven't really had a whole lot of follow up to report on, but I know she's doing really well. But th- just to let you know, we just to call back on that, we use three instruments to look at the caregiver stress. We use the caregiver stress questionnaire, instrumental activities of daily living, and physical self maintenance scales. So high stress level is a ten. Let's just say. And uh, the caregiver stress level at the beginning was six. And uh, health of the caregiver at the beginning was about a three, which is pretty healthy. But at the end, the caregiver stress went down to four. The caregiver had less stress. As the person becomes more autosufficient, less dependent, able to do more, maybe a little more cognizant, that seems to reduce the stress in the, in the caregiver also. So we use the... Um, the physical maintenance, like toilet and feeding, and what can they do for themselves? Physical ambulation, bathroom, and then we—that uh, was the, I guess, the lot and instrumental activities thing. It looks at ability to use the telephone, food preparation, laundry. Sure, sure, yeah, all of the sort of basic things that somebody would need to be able to do to be independent. You know. Yep. So her uh, normal was fourteen, and she actually returned to normal. She went started at uh, an eleven and went to fourteen, which was totally normal and her activity. So was it severely impaired? But even that little bit, she's going to notice a change, and also the caregiver obviously noticed the change. So yeah, Joe, let me ask you another question about the actual light device. Like you guys, in reading the poster, you added. So you started with the sort of transcranial, the part that goes on the head, um, the light board. It goes on the head and then added the nose at some point, like a week after the other components were added. Well, why did you wait? What was there like a thinking in that or just we didn't have it until a week started? Was there a, a reason for waiting the week? Both. I think that that, that was one of the reviewers comments. So that very observant of you, Nate. But one of the things was one, yes, we were waiting for it to arrive. But two, when we looked at the literature and um, we de- definitely thought about this, the literature that we were kind of going on was the uh, the Via Light group. The V Light V I V I E Light. That V Light you're talking about. V Light. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That was the study, and they used a a helmet. They did the nose, the intranasal every day, and then I think they came in two or three times a week for a helmet treatment. Yeah, that's the Salt March paper from 2017 okay. with the limb. Yeah. Okay. And that was great, and to have I mean all those all those researchers from I've been presenting at the at the NALT, the North American Association of Laser Therapists, for years. Those are my colleagues and my peers. And so I really appreciate that they did the groundbreaking research that allowed you know me to get better, my mom to get better, and these people to get better. But when, mm. we, did the, when we did the calculations, we realized we were given 42 times the power with our helmet that the Saltimark paper was doing. So we were a little, hmm, not, you know, that's a, 42 times is a lot. How did you figure the 42 times uh, thing in terms of? Total joules. And uh, that's why you have a medical physicist on your team. All right. A lot of calculations. So we did want to see, well, what happens? Is there any going to be any adverse? Are they going to feel anything? Absolutely no. Just like the literature says, no adverse uh, events, nothing, nothing negative. Then we added the intranasal just to see, uh, give it a week and then let it rip. And that's only about 14 joules of power, that intranasal thing for its time. So it's very low powered. When we had, I think, 2,000 joules, I think that's the number. I I don't have it in front of me. But the intranasal really didn't introduce too much more. Too much more power, yeah. But see, the difference was our helmet is continuous wave. It's on. It's just on. Whereas the 810 intranasal, 810 nanometer intranasal device that we used at a 10 hertz frequency. So it kind of flickered. Pulsing type thing. Yeah. So what, what it kind of uh, the background of our theory was that like, let's just put light on the brain. Let's just light it up and then use the intranasal as sort of a driver, sort of like a rhythm, you know, like there's the volume. Now here's the beat and see what happens. And so that's kind of was our, our, uh, are thinking on that. Let's try to light up the brain a little bit. So Joe, it's a fascinating case. Congratulations on um, on the poster. And I understand you guys have may have 
gotten a paper received for publication as well? Uh, thank you, Nate. Yeah, it's, uh, we were uh, just recently after like, you know, months of work, we got our paper accepted to be pu- published in the uh, photomedicine and laser surgery. So we should see that come out and hopefully it's going to, you know, I think it's going to be, there'd be a lot of things to talk about and you're the first one that got to, to, to ask the good questions, Nate. Yeah. Please send it to me when it when it's published. That would be exciting. I am also curious if if you've had any other cases like this. Of course, one case is exciting, but you know everybody has the sort of uh, astonishing cases. The one case, you know, the end of one. But what we're all after is, you know, from a, obviously from a scientific point of view, is reproducibility. Is this was there something magical about this one person? Was it your magical personality, or could I, you know, somebody like me that doesn't have a necessarily a magical personality? Could I operate this and get similar results? Have you had, I mean, is there, uh, have, A, have you had any other anecdotes uh, where people have had any type of positive uh, turnarounds? And B, do you have plans for more, you sort of a, a larger study? Yes. Many people start the care and just did not have the amount of documentation that we had with this case. Yeah. So you can have bits and pieces of it and my mom is talking better, walking better, you know, have it, smiling, laughing, joking, following instructions, cueing other people who are early responders. But it didn't have all of the data, you know. Right, right. You need a lot of documentation to do an academic case for sure, for sure. Yeah. And, you know, we're, we are moving forward with you know, different research projects to see if we can kind of nail down what is kind of happening inside the cranium when you put light on it, you know? Yeah. You talk about reaching the brain. And so I'm sort of looking at it, a little bit looking at it now and trying to say, if I do a clinical trial, do I want to do it? I mean, I'm a clinical researcher and that's what I do and I can build a trial, but am I going to go for foundation money? Is somebody going to be interested in this? Do I have to just do it in my office? Right. Oh, yeah. All the fun questions of research. Exactly. As you know, you know how that goes, but we're just making sure that we're going to have, a, we'll wait for the paper to come out, get the feedback from the scientific community to say, you know, let's see what they say, because we kind of did a lot, uh, put a lot on the smorgasbord there, of things that we introduced. And I, we had a lot mm-hmm. of uh, positive feedback from the researchers in Aus, uh, Australia where they have a huge public health push to get people to do light therapy in their home, photobiomodulation in their home. So everybody picks up a little piece of it, you know, like that's a good helmet and that's a good colors. And I like the questionnaires and I like using the smelly markers. And so there's a lot for people to pick on and hopefully they'll, they'll pique their interest in, and we can, you know, move forward with a larger study. But remember, Marvin Berman, who was on uh, a few episodes ago, took him almost 10 years to get his clinical trial going. Oh, yeah, it takes forever, yeah. He did get that started at uh, Temple Yeah, this week. It's, it's got listed in the clinical trials, so he's moving forward. So I think it's good to you know get this word out and get the thought leaders and clinicians who, you know, there's not a whole lot of clinicians that are out there saying, we're going to help you with your reverse your dementia or reverse your cognitive decline. So there's a front runners right there. And then you come out with something that's a little bit, you know, outer space. What kind of helmet is that? So you have to break those barriers down too. But I think people, I mean, light works, put it where you want it and uh, we'll put it right on your head. That's what I think. So I think that's a great place to end. This is a really instructive, and I thank you for your time and for your efforts, especially for publication. Um, I know it's not just like you know taking care of patients, of course, of our favorite thing, but it's also the contribution making towards academia it takes time and effort, and like you said, resources. So I really appreciate the fact that you've spent the time to at least document the one case, and then um, and then write it up, and then write it for publication in, in a journal. That's excellent. Congratulations. Thank you, Nate. How can people, um, if they want to consider using the light helmet or be in touch with you, what's the best way for them to to reach you or find out about your work? Well, the website is proneurolight.com, P-R-O-N-E-U-R-O-L-I-G-H-T. 
And I'm, I'm Dr. Joe, D-R-J-O-E at proneurolight.com. Excellent. I really appreciate your time. Thanks so much for uh, spending these uh, last uh, 45 minutes with us. Thanks, Nate. I'd like to come back and talk to you a little bit about some new intranasal photobiomodulation that we're working on. It was pretty, pretty exciting. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We, we'd love to have you on again. Thanks so much. Thanks a bunch. So that's our episode. I hope it was useful to you. Check out the show notes on iTunes or on our website where we've summarized the key points. If you find the information here valuable, please consider giving us a five-star rating on iTunes and leaving comments in the comments section. It will really help us bring this message to as many people as we can. If you have questions or comments, connect with us on social media. Finally, to support us, go to patreon.com forward slash evolving past and consider hitting the button and becoming a patron of this show. That's Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, patreon.com forward slash evolving past. Thanks and talk to you next time.